Good afternoon, everybody, and thank Dr. Mailer for asking me to speak today. Uh, today, as many of you are aware, finishing up right now is the yard site, the 20th yard site of the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. I'm not going to try to make any halachic rulings or any rulings on the politics or the value, but I am going to talk about a number of uh, issues that I think are worth talking about. Part of my comments are based on a tshuva by Rabbi Chaim Jachter, based in turn on tshuvas of Harav Hinkin and of uh, Professor Eliab Shochatman. Part are based on other studies and on reading some materials. I was not able to read any of the speeches which are typically given in uh, the State of Israel on the occasion of the art site before I, none of, none of these the speeches this year before talking this afternoon. It's been 20 years. Many of us in this room remember the horror that we all felt when we saw that the Prime Minister was assassinated. I'm going to start, though, by talking about something that happened many, many years ago and was mentioned in our Parsha. We read yesterday in Lech Lecha that after Avram returned from Egypt, he and his uh, shepherds battled with the shepherds of Lot. The land was not able to bear them. Lo nasautam haaretz, so shevet yachtad. Ki nei rechusham rav, velo yachlu la shevet yachtad. Vayi riv bein roe mikne avram, uvein roe mikne lot, vakna niva prizi az yoshev baaretz, vayomer avram el lot, al nati meriva beini uvein nacha, uvein roe ai uvein roe echa, ki anashim achim anachnu. The land was not able to bear them so that they might dwell together. Their substance was so great that they could not dwell together. There was strife between Avram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. The Canaani and the Perizzi were then in the land. Avram said to Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, before we are brethren. And then Avram says something quite interesting. Remember that Avram had been promised that the entire land would be for his descendants. And according to Seder Olam, at least the rabbinic official reconstruction, of the history, he had been promised already even before he left his father. Uh, he had come to Canaan once and gone back. He had been promised multiple times that the land would be his and his descendants. God does not tell Avram to do anything. Avram simply says, Is not the whole land before you? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. And then he says, Im hasma'ol ve'emina ve'ima yamin ve'asma'ila. And according to most of the Meforshim, he says, you want to go north, I'll go south. You want to go south, I'll go north. In other words, Avraham sees that the situation was untenable between him and the other shepherds and is prepared to divide the land. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is what Rabin was doing or that this was what was going on in the Oslo process. But I do think that we need to have the perspective from our Parsha in order to discuss the legacy and the meaning of Rabin. I'm going to talk very briefly about a few things. I'm not going to recommend that uh, the uh, yard site become a fast day, although I read that Natan Sharansky does so. He says you fast for uh, on the 3rd of Tishrei for an assassination, we should fast on the 12th of Cheshvan for an assassination. Nor am I going to say that we should either curse or bless Rabin. Uh, most of the discussions talk about whether or not he was a Rodef. Most of you know something about the law of Rodef. I'll just review one or two very interesting things very, very quickly. We have the idea of a Baba Machteret, the person who comes uh, in uh, subterraneously. One can kill a thief. And then it said, Im ba lo hergecha, hashkem lo hergo. If somebody is going to kill you, you should act first and kill him. This is from the Gemara in Sanhedrin. The idea, at least as expressed by the assassin, was that Rabin's choice would lead to the death of many people in Israel and maybe to his own death, and therefore he should act first. And in point of fact, the laws of Rodef were extended. Uh, some rabbis thought that you could kill somebody who was going to create a danger to the community. Uh, I didn't check the Ramah inside, but the sources that I looked at said that the Ramah said even something like forgery could be a uh, dealt with by killing somebody because in his day kings would kill entire Jewish communities if they were found to have forged documents. 
It's interesting that in a rabbinic system in which capital punishment was essentially eliminated in practice, the Rodef was somebody who would be killed according to either a person acting out of imin imminent danger or a Beitin in something that was not quite so imminent. I don't think that the Dean Rodef applies here and the rabbis who Rabbi Shach uh, Jachter looked at do not. A second area beyond Rodef has to do with the idea of Malchut or of chief executive. The Radbaz on Rambam in Hilchot Mlachim is quoted by the Tzitz Eliezer and by the Raviyah, by Rav Kook, in ways that suggest that in days when there's no Nevua, the people get to appoint the leader, and that leader has something of the status of a Melech. In other words, the Prime Minister of Israel, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with the policy or not, has something of the role of the Melech and gets to decide what the policy ought to be. The argument here goes that, first of all, there's never any call in rabbinic literature for assassinating kings. We have the biblical story, David, who became a Melech, was able to kill Shaul, but didn't do it, even though Shaul was seeking to kill him, and many, many other such stories. The real question is, can one overcome Jewish law for the sake of pikuach nefesh? I'm not going to rule on this today, but one could very easily look at the issues as placed by the Rabin policy and the Oslo Accords as having to deal with that kind of approach. Now, what about that question, the idea of Eretz Yisrael Shlema, and whether that's more important than security? I don't know the answer. I think that history may very well lead us to the conclusion that many, many people in this room, I think, will agree with that the Oslo process probably would not have led to a more secure Israel. I'm not arguing that it would have. Uh, I am suggesting, however, that this was probably the most important aspect behind the assassination. In other words, that I don't think the assassin would have imply, uh, uh, called upon the law of Rotef without the idea of Eretz Yisrael Shlema and the impossibility in Jewish law of having of alienating any part of the land of Israel. Uh, in this way, he was a follower, you might say, of Rabbi Tzvi Yehuda Kuk, who wrote very, very compellingly about the importance of these things. The fourth topic that I think is important to think about, though, is, I'll call it the difference between the father and the son, or the son and the father. If Tzvi Yehuda Kuk emphasized the importance of the entire land of Israel, his father, the Rabbi, uh, Av uh, Rabbi Avram Yitzchak Kuk, is well known for his feeling that even secular Jews were part of the story of the redemption of the land. My feeling is that the lesson that we can learn 20 years later has very little to do with the politics and an awful lot to do with the heightened issues in the political discourse having to do with secular versus religious. Many of us remember that there were cries, Bidam ve'esh et rabin nigaresh, rabin bogeid, mavet le rabin, and so on from the one side. And the secular Jews were not as good as making slogans that were anti-religious, but Rabin had a history of not really paying much attention to the religious side, not taking very much uh, account of it. Some people say that the single biggest reason for the 1977 upset was that Menachem Begin and Likud paid attention to the religious people, and Rabin held meetings that went into Shabbat or started before Shabbat was over, angering the National Religious Party and causing them to leave the coalition and to leave the support. I think from our point of view, that issue, in terms of the contemporary politics, has not gotten any easier in the ensuing years, given the problems and the, um, and the violence that's going on in the land of Israel today. I think that religious nationalist Jews and secular national Jews, nationalist Jews have to work even harder than before. And it seems to me that that would be the way to overcome the legacy of the assassination of Rabin 20 years ago. 
Ben Zoma said, Ezu Gibor HaKoveshit Yitzro, the person who overcomes his tendencies. And the person who can do that is better than somebody who engages in conquest. Rabbi Hananya ben Akasha Omer Ratzak Kadosh Baruch Hu Luzakot et Yisrael Ofichach Yerba Lahem Torah Mitzvot Shene Amar Adonai Chavetz Laman Tzikot Yadil Torah V'yadil.